Hi, everyone. Welcome to Hauser & Wirth. I'm Russell Salmon, Director of Public Programs here at the gallery. We're thrilled to have you all here tonight. And we have some empty seats up here if anyone wants to come up to the front. Um, we're thrilled to have you here this evening for this very special conversation between artist Nicholas Party and the Frick Collection's Deputy Director and Chief Curator, Xavier Solomon. This conversation takes place within the exhibition Exemplary Modern Sophie Tauber Arp with Contemporary Artists and is also in tandem with the site-specific installation Nicholas Party and Rosalba Carriera at the Frick Collection on view until March of 2024. The exhibition here examines the versatility and legacy of Swiss avant-garde master Sophie Tauber Arp and juxtaposes examples from her oeuvre with new and existing work made by contemporary artists. Nicholas Party's contribution presents an ensemble of bright polychromatic head sculptures set against a black and white photographic mural of Tauber Arp's puppets and theatrical stagings, settings that have helped to inspire some of Party's previous two-dimensional and mural works. Utilizing a similar correlation between the art historical and the contemporary, the installation at the Frick Collection combines Rosalba Carriera's portrait of a man in pilgrim's costume with a suite of pastel portraits and mural works by party. Also, if you haven't yet seen Nicholas's incredible solo exhibition at our 22nd Street Gallery in Chelsea, it is a must. The exhibition Nicholas Party Swamp is on view until the 21st of October, and we will be hosting a walkthrough of that show with Nicholas and the Morgan Library's Isabel Durvaux on Saturday, the 7th of October. Thank you again for being here. Now, please join me in welcoming Nicholas Party and Xavier Solomon. Thank you, everyone. Uh, wonderful to see so many people on this beautiful day. Um, you know, summer is really over. Um, this is an incredible moment, I think, in New York, because between 22nd Street and 75th Street, you're going to see a lot of Nicholas Party. And, you know, three exhibitions with very different formats, media, themes, um, but obviously all the extraordinary works of Nicholas. Um, so I thought. You know, we'll talk about all three shows in different ways, and I hope everyone has seen them. If you haven't, go and, and have a look at the others. Uh, but let's start with what we have here. So you're responding and uh, kind of inspired by another Swiss artist. You're Swiss yourself. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the show and how it came about, your vision for it? Yeah, like the, the I think the, yeah, the invitation was to kind of respond to you know, like uh, her work, which is so obviously diverse and, and multi multimedia and like it takes shapes in so many different objects and different shapes. And she, uh, yeah, she's really a, an amazing, fantastic artist that uh, I think had an influence on, on a lot of artists. In, in my case, uh, I think I was very, um, I mean, as a Swiss artist, like as maybe some people know, like she was even in the 50 kind of Swiss francs kind of notes and you know you see your work uh, quite quite a lot in Switzerland and she's kind of kind of an iconic figure there um, and especially with the you know history of Dada and Zurich and, and all that moving in in, in in the 20s uh, but I was always like um, I mean when I discovered her work the, the puppets and the painted heads um, I think it's one of the things that really inspired me to do those heads that I did like uh, you know maybe like seven seven years ago now. Um, and uh, so when, when I got the invitation to, to, to be part of this show, it was kind of a great kind of opportunity to basically try to put the, my heads uh, in kind of, kind of conversation with her kind of uh, basically like puppets that she designed for this uh, King Stag that was set up in, in, uh, in, in 1918. The, the show was actually uh, only happened one night uh, because um, that year the Spanish flu was... Uh, <laughs> Kind of starting, and they killed millions and millions of people. I think like six or seven million people that year. Um, and um, anyway, like so, the the, the <laughs> this green kind of note. The uh, the show was only basically show, seen only once, uh, but obviously there was photographs and archive, and it became some kind of an iconic 
uh, use of puppetry and kind of how like the uh, kind of avant-garde of that time was used to do that kind of amazing kind of visual kind of um, in universe and uh, and she basically I think two years later I mean we just saw that like in, in 1920 she painted few heads she called them data heads which was basically a very um, simple shape of her heads uh, that she just basically painted this very kind of like geometric kind of shapes on it uh, and when I saw that that was like very kind of I don't know exactly when, what age I saw it, like for the first time, but I think it's, when I started to do those heads, that was one of the main inspiration, was to basically find a very kind of generic si like shape of a heads, like from kind of a mannequin or like a kind of hat holder uh, or like a, yeah, like a doll. And basically like the shape itself is kind of very simple and it's really more like when it's painted that the objects kind of come to reality and it's, I think it's where there's kind of an echo with, with her way that she was using often like those kind of painted objects, like, you know, like com compared to her husband that was more or less never painting his, his shapes. She was painting kind of objects and sculptures and obviously she was doing so many different kind of things, but that's kind of where those, my work kind of meets. And I, I think like it's in the, it's really great to, uh, so the black and white photos that you see obviously is, is the, uh, Kind of blown up like this. The the if people saw the show that was on MoMA in 2020, I think it was. Um, I think it was supposed to be actually during also during the pandemic, weirdly enough. <laughs> and uh, anyway, like this, the sculptures are maybe like that's yeah maybe that size. Uh, so you can like the, the the what I love about what happens there is that the um, basically the human size now like in the in the room. Uh, they're more or less like the size of humans, and obviously my heads are very different scales. So there's like something kind of, I think, kind of interesting with the scales of those characters. I also thought that somehow like um, that the uh, the her puppets that is basically on stage, they kind of become more like this the spectator, the audience of my kind of sculptures. Uh, I thought actually it will be the opposite that my sculptures will be the audience looking at the. Uh, but actually, I feel feel like when it was installed, I felt it's more like you kind of become the puppets and the puppets becomes the viewers and basically like they kind of interact I think in a kind of very kind of uh, kind of fun way and it's it was kind of in a way a simple thing to do just print out the uh, archive photos of this play that happened only once and just like put those kind of uh, heads into it so yeah and it's it's been super exciting to do this little collage. What was her work um, behind your idea of producing those heads before the show? I mean, you've been producing heads of that kind along those lines for, for a while, and you've had them in, in other shows in the past. Were you thinking about her work when you were first creating them, or is that a separate, in a way, coincidence? Then? No, that was, yeah, I mean, those heads were not, none of those heads were made for this show. They're all actually more, they're all kind of my head that I had in my studio. Um, and I think, yeah, I think we didn't actually paint in any of those heads for specifically this show. Um, but uh, when I painted them first, yeah, I was kind of basically looking at different artists that had like those very generic kind of like painted faces. Um, and uh, yeah, she was one of the ones that really came to mind. And but that was obviously, that was way before <laughs> I was doing this, this show. So that's kind of came together really well. I can always imagine that in a hundred years time, someone is going to do a PhD on Nicholas Party, the curator. Um, so in a way the, the you know, you're, you're pretty unique as, as an artist, for, you know, someone who curates his own shows and you pay so much attention in all of your projects, it, you know, the space, the color of the walls, the, the shape of the doors. So in this case, you're juxt you know, part of the project is juxtaposing your work with her work through photography. In other cases, it's murals or, you know, a number of other uh, media. How does that work for you? I mean, it, it's so integral to what you do in a way. Um, yeah, I think it, was like, uh, it happened that uh, I think when I finished art school, I st um, we, with two friends we had like, a, which a lot of artists do after art school, I guess you have a little space, like a little gallery, like art running space that we had and uh, we were organizing shows and basically like displaying our work or other people's work and I think very quickly like out of like more like or having just fun, you know, if you just hang paintings on the wall, you don't have to. You, you, you don't have. You don't do enough in a way to just like occupy like time and having fun. So very quickly we started to do murals and like furniture, um, and uh, and it was really a way to kind of create like a almost like a theatrical kind of you know environment for art, but also trying trying to kind of 
take over the visual space where art is, is kind of displayed, which is, I guess, interesting in the context of Sophie Tarbo art because she was obviously very well known to, <laughs> to, to basically being like really one of the first kind of artists to really kind of push this like really all over because she designed like wall painting, architecture, fabric, she was an incredible dancer, she was dancing, you know, like designing her own clothes, like weaving her own clothes. Uh, like really mixing design, display, arts in, a, in an incredible, and it's, you know, it's maybe one of the reasons actually that she was left out a little bit among, she's a woman, but also because she was so diverse that, you know, art likes to have like very clear categories and like, okay, you're like an abstract painter and you were very important for that. And she was basically like doing so many things that artistry, I think, felt kind of a little bit lost of how to categorize her. Um, but uh, again, I think like when I do a show, I'm always like actually... There's like two parts, I guess, in my kind of kind of life or practice as as an artist is really like the studio kind of time, which obviously I love, <laughs> probably like the the best time. But like uh, sometimes the studio is obviously kind of a lonely, you know, like you you by yourself all day and you're doing your little paintings or little things. So like when the show comes, like if you let's say like if I was just hanging the painting, which is also very, kind of, but it, it it will take like a day or two. Like if I do, when I do all those big install, um, you know, like the Frick, which we did, like you have to spend like weeks in the, in, in the, in the space. So it's also like, it made me um, travel for much longer in spaces. Like, you know, every time I do a show, I need to go for a month, spend much more time in the, sp in the space. Like, uh, and I, I really, I really like that. I really like to kind of like be kind of in the location, making murals, like working with people, like, you know, from there, like you're really spending a good amount of time, um, and so like you ha I have this balance of like installing the show a few times a year. Like it takes like maybe I don't know like a, f a fourth of the year <laughs> in terms of time, uh, and and the rest is the studio. So it's two very different kind of kind of energy, I guess. And I really kind of I think I really like those those two those two occupation in a way. Because in a way, for you know, for all of us, um, Nicholas Party groupies, part of the thing is you know to travel and see the shows. Because I mean, when you see the show, it's it's a very different thing from seeing a piece in the museum in somebody's house. I mean, which is also wonderful, but um, you know, it's it's a ephemeral experience of you know for three months, six months, whatever it is, you have that those pieces together in a space designed and conceived by Nicholas. I always think of this you know 17th century description of someone going to the theater in Rome, and they see a play where the sets are designed by Bernini, the, the, great, the great sculptor, who has designed the sculptures, made the sculptures, designed the sets, because he's also a painter. But then it turns out that he has also written the play and he's acting in the play. <laughs> and so it's that kind of like total artist idea that, you know, it's, it's not just about producing, as you say, something in the studio and then throwing it into the world in a way, but you sort of mediate that through these incredible works of art, which are the exhibitions in themselves. Um, and, you know, having seen many of your projects in the last few years, I think it's, it's always really interesting to see how you respond to different um, locations or different artists or different ideas in a number of different ways. Um, which brings me to the point of, I mean, old masters, but not, you know, we all love and hate that word in equal ways, but um, artists from the past, let's say. So you, you know, you often put yourself in in dialogue, let's say, with artists like Sophie Tauber Arp or you know, Rosalba Carriera, or you know, in the past it's been, I don't know, Magritte or Brooklyn or a number of other artists. Um, and that's something you've done quite regularly. Um, you know, we all talk in the world between sort of museums and contemporary world about these interactions, which, you know, how meaningful are they? What do they mean, you know, for an artist today to be inspired by something from the past? Um, how does that actually work? But my question is really, how does that enrich you, inspires you? Um, is it the variety, you know, moving from, you know, you don't always respond to the same artist, obviously, and you respond to very different ones. And I think, you know, if you go to the Frick or downtown, you see responses to very, very different artists. I mean, Rosalba is a world away from, from Sophie Tauber Arp. Um, so how does that work for you as, 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 as an artist? Um, yeah, I think, like, yeah, it's a good... I don't know exactly how I got there, but I think one of the, maybe one of the, uh, what happened is like, you know, saying about the creating shows and installing, I think maybe I felt limited with my, <laughs> with my walls. Like I thought it was like maybe not complex enough sometimes or not like diverse enough in terms of what was, you know, in the show. 
And I think quite quite quickly I thought like, oh, it would be great to have a, you know, a language or like a, a reference for something very different that brings a little bit more complexity in, 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 in the show and how you see my work, I guess. I feel like sometimes, I, and maybe that's also like when I started, you know, paint walls or doing a lot of staging, I thought like maybe the work by itself will not be like, you know, interesting enough to just <laughs> stand by its own in a way. And I thought like, oh, maybe if I add this or a mural, like, yeah, let's say I did a lot of mural of basically like, and it's what I did at the, um, at the Frick, or even once it's here. Um, basically, I, I will, I will, what I did at the Flag um, Foundation when it, the pastel show, when I will basically copy or replicate like an existing artwork, which I will maybe like custom a little bit or edit a little bit. And it was like just, a, I mean, it's really, really a collage kind of practice, I guess, a sample practice, but it was a, it's a great way to basically you know, have my work on top or mixed with something that is, as you said, kind of belongs to a completely different universe. And it can, it brings just complexity and like, for me to, to look at and, and hopefully for the, for the viewer. So I think it's really kind of coming from that angle of someone that loves looking at, you know, a lot of different arts and I consume a lot of art, but kind of not in a very academic or like very like even followers. I'm just like, <laughs> like it's very visual and kind of intuitive the way I do it, and, and but I, I love like seeing, I love the music. Fump, I love the museum with like a lot of different, you know. And as as you know, you uh, at the Frick, the, the collages of periods and style and meaning of art is like you know like insane. It's like really like centuries that are mixed up in one room. Um, and if you go to the Met, of course, they're like you know like a little bit like you feel oh it's all old masters, but it's often like four hundred years sometimes or 200 years in like two rooms of, of work or like, you know, geographically very different themes, very different. Um, so I, I really love that idea of like, you know, kind of collapsing different thing, universe and, and, and it's, I guess like the way of doing it was like doing murals and um, maybe that's kind of something that's, I sometimes say that's, I never really kind of, I mean, I do sometimes, but I do a lot of samples of those that nature when I do a mural because I feel it's ephemeral, it's not really, like typically, like the yeah, the, at the Frick, there's those drapery that belongs to Quentin de la Tour or Oliotar, and you know they really it's not really my work. I mean, I, I just it's almost like I'm just make it's more like a craft. I'm making them on the wall. It's obviously slightly edited. I mean, it's, it is very edited. It's only a part of the fabric, but it, I will not be. I will not feel comfortable to just put that on a canvas and just say, oh, that's my work. It will be kind of strange in a way. So like on the wall with my work on top of it, that's. For me, it kind of it does make sense, and it makes like a work by itself. Um, and uh, and again, it's why like the the medium of the mural is, and it actually, I mean, obviously that's not a mural here; it's like just a collage. But that's like a very good example of how you can create um, kind of a visual kind of c conversation between two things that is just like happen in the space. And if it was happening on on the canvas, maybe there will be a little bit harder. Even if sometimes I do a little collage with art, like you know, I did those portraits with the body that is made out of another artwork, so I'm exploring that too, but um, yeah, that's kind of something that I love doing. And you know, as someone who works in a museum where we don't collect anything post-1900, um, I always feel lucky that I live in this period because, you know, if you think back 50 years ago when so much was about abstraction, about, about cutting the links to the past and like something that's totally new and, and not looking at anything, you know, let's go and kind of destroy museums and just think about it in different ways. Now I think there is a whole generation and you're one of the key artists in this, in this group who are so embedded in what happened before and so inspired and so rejuvenated and reimagining and rethinking uh, what is in a museum space that's much older and you know, from a hundred years ago, two, three, four hundred years ago. Um, Right now in New York, you know, the three shows, we were talking about this a little bit before, um, you're, you're responding to three artists who, by total coincidence, I guess, are, are three women. So Rosalba Carriera at the Frick, Sophie Tauber Arp here, and Rosa Bonheur in a, in a number of works downtown at 22nd Street. Um, I know that wasn't planned, but I think in a way it shows the, the variety, you know, a, a 19th century French artist, uh, a, a modern early 20th century artist, uh, an 18th century pastelist in Venice. We move from, you know, Paris to Zurich to, to Venice. Um, what do you think about this kind of incredible coincidence and how that works out in New York? And also Rosa, uh, yeah. Rosalba, we have all like... <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of, because obviously every kind of, 
those free shows this year, I have those like free kind of uh, um, artists that I love. I mean, this one obviously was kind of, I was invited because they were doing the show about Sophie Torba, so like the, the, the connection was almost like commissioned by, you know, like uh, it's the first time I respond like, like that directly to her work. Uh, I think with you, uh, Rosalba is like, you know, like you have a big kind of, I think I have a relationship with her. <laughs> that, uh, you know, like, and you can, like that is kind of, we want the kind of strongest one that I have with another artist uh, because of the love of the medium of pastel and the love of her work and uh, how it grew into my practice. But also because, you know, what's been happening with you, I guess, in the last like two years uh, and how you've been like diving into this Rosalba kind of uh, universe, uh, which is a, it's pretty geeky and pretty specific. I think like sometimes we discuss the two of us, like, I guess if you see from outside, her work is great, but I understand that some people can be like, okay, well, it's just a bunch of, you know, I mean, you know the, the messages that go backwards and forwards about Rosalba. Think, yeah, I don't think there's that many yeah, people that are like, still... It's just the two of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. And, but we, I guess we love, and the, the work, and it's so great to have this project. And, um, and I guess the, the Rosa Bonheur is a very kind of recent uh, kind of... Uh, kind of collaboration that I have with her in, in, in my work. And, the, and I think it's, again, that's the two, and, it, and, and it kind of, it's your job to kind of do shows. And it's like, really like quite what happened in, in, in Paris like a year or two years ago when they, they, they did a show in Orsay and in, in Bordeaux, I think it traveled in, in one other museum. And basically to kind of like revitalize the, 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 her work, and especially having a lot of like writers and other artists actually respond to her work. Um, because she was not like really looked at, and to be honest, I just I discovered really her work uh, through that lens of this show, and it's like really kind of how important it is to do those shows because it's you know like uh, for the for for artists you know like very often you will discover arts in museums or in shows in catalog in in, this, in that case I didn't see the show right, because I was I was here, and I just see the so the catalog and obviously they have an amazing Rosa Bonheur famous maybe one of the second most famous painting at the Met, uh, the, you know, the, the horse kind of fair. And I think when I discovered her work, what, what was happening with the, in the different themes that I was working on uh, was her basically kind of revolutionary approach to kind of basically um, perceive and portray animals and, 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 and how like there was, there's an essay in the book that I found it very fascinating about the, something that I find interesting about how anachronism is inter very interesting as um, to explore artistry, because like, it's basically like looking at her work in the, uh, the kind of the lens of the eco-feminism, which obviously was not existing at all in the 19th, 19th century. Even the, the, the idea of feminism was very different. But eco-feminism, which is a very specific branch of kind of uh, feminism, and if you, it's really like if you look at the work through that lens, the work I think start to be like really kind of extremely modern and I mean modern, extremely contemporary and extremely kind of current and you can like really basically like um, see that she was probably one of the first artists to depict animal with empathy and like with this kind of new, not, now it sounds kind of normal I guess that but think about 19th century how we kind of see wildlife and it's very it's very different <laughs> than now. Now of course we have this idea of like oh like Animals, yeah, they have feelings. They have like we need to kind of somehow like be a little bit cautious about where we're going with with all this. And she's kind of one of the, and I think she was almost never seen that way until kind of now-ish, basically, like uh, with this lens. And um, and because of the different themes of the show that I did there, down there, I think she was the perfect kind of uh, fit to kind of have this conversation also this homage and this you know hope, hopefully some people don't know her her work like as well that goes to the show and like you know what i did exactly when i discovered the show and it's kind of um, an, another like entrance and they can go to the to the met and see this really really incredible uh painting uh, um that the that some of the anecdotes are that uh that we have think they, they kind of reveal how cool rosa bonner was but she basically wanted to paint that uh, horse fair uh, I believe she wanted to paint more or less that. Well, it was a very impressive kind of scenery. Basically, it was you know when you buy your your, your horses uh, in Paris, and it was forbidden for me, for women to to go there. So she wanted to kind of do all the drawing, all the studies, and so she was she basically had to ask a special permits to wear kind of uh, men's clothes to kind of disguise there to kind of paint all this kind of shebang of like horses. And and the, when you see the painting, it's really kind of wonderful because every horses are basically 
scared and like trying, you know, like they're really kind of having a hard time. And there's only one horse that is like on, on one side that is kind of calm and is the only one that's basically have a, some sort of a relationship with the with the human that is kind of calm. The older one, you know, all the other ones are like arr, arr, trying to kind of like wrestling with those. And again, it's like really, a, and it's like this gigantic kind of uh, very spectacular painting that um, that is at, at the end, I guess, of the French wig and, and at the Met. And um, yeah, it's really a fantastic painting full of those little anecdotes. And um, and in my show, I guess I did four portraits uh, with four different reference to uh, to animals like this. For example, this dog that oh sorry, this uh, depiction of this dog that is I find it very touching and, and moving. That is also again like very different. That's Usually, like hunting dogs, obviously, in, especially in British painting and French painting, they're represented like really kind of in action and brave and like kind of like really running. And she's like painting this dog after the hunts, and basically, the dog is like completely like exhausted and like you know, basically asking the viewer, like, Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> I'm like, just like, and then you really have the, the, the eye of this kind of creature, like, really asking humans what's going on and why are you doing this and it's a, I find it like very I guess kind of brain very touching and you know starting with the heads here in this show you know your work often sculpture and painting when it's it's to do with portraiture is very sort of genderless you know people are always sort of wondering you know is it a man is it a woman does it actually matter if it's a man or a woman um, they are somewhere in the imaginary world but somehow feel very real in the, their sort of imagination um, if you move to the Frick, uh, you have created two responses, two pastels that respond to a Rosalba portrait of a man, albeit a very effeminate and, and, and over-the-top 18th century man. Uh, but yours, again, are somewhere in between genders, in between modernity and, and, and the past. And then at 22nd Street, you have, again, these four fantastic portraits with a dog, eagle, goat, donkeys, and in a way, animals are also portraits, you know, and, and Rosa Bonheur and other artists were doing effectively portraits of animals. There's a whole tradition all the way back to the Renaissance, if not before, uh, of portraying animals as well as human beings. So the broader question for me is, you know, what is portraiture for you? Because you kind of go between reality, imagination, and you define those works as portraits. But of course, you don't have a sitter. I mean, some are based on paintings or, you know, the animals in paintings in this case, but otherwise they're just coming out of your imagination. Yes, so yeah, I mean, when I started to do, I always tell the anecdote, I guess, because it is uh, how it happens, but uh, I, I kind of, when I started to do pastel, it was doing portraits and it was like, just, I saw this um, Picasso pastel um, in, in a show in Basel and uh, basically the pastel was like, uh, he's kind of, after the Cubism, he had this moment of Botero-esque kind of like, you know, when he very, he's very inspired by classic sculptures and Greek sculptures, and he's using a bit of pastel because probably he wants to do those very like roundy shapes. Anyway, I saw that portraits, and uh, the next day I started to do portraits very like, indirectly influenced by his, and then very quickly by basically the sculptures that he was looking at. And very quickly, like this kind of person emerged, I guess, from, <laughs> from the paper, right? I mean, artists, very, I think, often you're trying to basically create something that you don't know exactly what it is and you know why you're creating it so you, you can have this relationship it's like you know if you meet someone and you know everything about the person you probably don't really need to have a drink with the person it's kind of like <laughs> it's kind of boring so it's, it's kind of a little bit of similar you don't going to create something that you know in advance exactly what it's going to be so the portrait kind of like emerged like that and very quickly yeah they had this like makeup and Kind of the gender was not defined, and um, and I think like then I explored more and more this, and I was I was feeling basically comfortable with that that character, that portrait that I, that, that I was kind of depicting, and um, I think it goes with this basically um, idea that is old as probably like you know human creating kind of arts, this 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 idea of beauty and this idea of like the ideal something you know the end in that case the ideal face and i think especially in greek aesthetic which changed a bit in roman but in greek aesthetic the, the, they don't depict a person it's like always an ideal an ideal you know face basically like the perfect proportions uh, of a face and and as we know today we're still very upset by <laughs> obsessed by the ideal face you know like the ideal weight the ideal height the ideal nose the ideal you know and it's kind of we have this it's now with obviously surgery it's, it's there's a lot of like of that but i think more than that there's like the the the, the culture of the um 
makeup but filter like digital filter and i think that is kind of fascinating how like you know every people that send TikTok videos or Instagram or like photos. I mean, the iPhone itself has a very strong filter. Even if you think there's no filter, there's a very strong filter that makes you look actually, there's, you, you have less kind of marks on your face. Basically, if you take a photo with your iPhone, it's like embedded in the, in the lens and everything. It's very, if you do use a Leica, for example, it's the opposite filter. You know, Leica is known if you do black and white Leica, like you have much more, you will see much more texture that actually maybe you have on your face. Um, and uh, and I kind of I think my portrait are basically like this. Uh, I'm trying maybe to explore that um, that surface that we all like so kind of chasing, and it's been like that forever. I guess like you know like we nobody kind of is almost attracted to normal normality in a way like this. And this the, and it's I was also find it kind of interesting that this kind of perfect face is almost kind of not changing. It is kind of a gender less kind of face that is you know, I guess the age of like, I don't know, 20, 25 or something, but still like with feature of maybe older a little bit. Um, and, and this kind of ghostly kind of face is, I find it like very fascinating and it's kind of this kind of almost like, a, yeah, ghosts kind of spirits kind of face that is haunting all humans basically, like on a, on a kind of daily basis because obviously humans, you, when you face the mirror, it's more the Rembrandt portrait, where it's kind of like, oh, I guess <laughs> that's, the, that's the kind of the opposite of what I'm describing. It's like, oh, I guess I'm aging, and this, the filter is like really the, his filter is like really not like making any kind of compromise on his. Uh, so I'm basically doing the opposite filter. <laughs> kind of this yeah, I'm weird. not sure Rembrandt was using an iPhone filter <laughs> in, in his mind, but um, and also there are similarities. It struck me the show here. I mean, the room here that you worked on um, with the Frick project, you know, at the Frick, it's so much about disguise and, and carnival and revealing and makeup and pastel and what you were talking about right now. But here also, there's so much about, you know, the theater, the, the, the puppets, these heads that could be anyone, anything. Um, and in a way, I think the, 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 the conversation between the two shows here on the Upper East Side, it's, it's really interesting, but by coincidence in a way, but... Um, what, what do you think about the, the, the sort of connection between the two? I mean, it is very, as you said, it's so different the world because like Sophie Torrell is basically an icon of the avant-garde, like the whole idea of like, you know, like, yeah, breaking roles and like going like super kind of far in terms of like innovation and she's like really kind of, um, and her data ads and this is really kind of the aesthetic at that at that we have thing like 1920s and having that like most people will be like I mean that's that's the myth of the avant-garde but it's the reality like it it was like now everything we it's almost impossible to feel surprised by anything visually in a way but back then it was still very much the case like you will be like and it will look it looked like oh my god what what the hell is this <laughs> it's like it's too simple it's like very not well done or whatever so I think as like that is such a different approach to art that Rosalba, because Rosalba was like a commercial artist, like, you know, most of her production is, is commission um, and her work is, you know, usually appreciated by, by, by the elites. And so there's like a very different energy in, in those two kind of art, artists, obviously. Uh, and I think actually the, the two, and that's kind of what maybe art is very kind of good at, in a way, it's to kind of make those like weirds on, and I guess, anachronic bridge, bridges. And, they, and maybe that's what's like, uh, when, when I think about it, it's like oh, be, me being in, in the conversation with Sophie and, and, and then Ros Rosalba, it's like making this really strange bridge between actually Sophie and Rosalba. <laughs> which, and then suddenly there's, there's some, somehow there's a conversation start, start, start to happen. And, um, and I, I find it like, Kind of, kind of fascinating again because the medium of the medium of visual arts is allowed you to do those connections um, in in a way like very smoothly somehow, and you can really create those like connection in 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 a, in a pretty kind of yeah easy way in a way, and it, I think it's kind of pretty amazing to have those two things in in, in the same time. And you know, you you've worked m mostly in the fields of sort of portraiture, landscape, still life. Those are sort of your three. Uh, main themes that you work around, but in the show downtown, I think it's the first time that there are dinosaurs. <laughs> um, so um, we've we've had conversations about dinosaurs in the past in your studio. But I, as as any kid who loved dinosaurs when you know when you're growing up, um, 
why dinosaurs and, and what is this new sort of body of work I hope that will develop over time? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting uh, because uh, through dinosaurs people uh, definitely have a soft spot. Like as I show them and everybody's like, oh my god, the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, it's fascinating. Uh, I mean, I think like, um, I mean, they, they, they came from a lot of different places, I guess. But uh, I think like what happened is, uh, weirdly, I mean, weirdly enough, this, what happened is I had, you know, uh, we had a baby like last year. Um, and 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 there's and actually there's a baby in the show which is uh, our baby swan, uh, but we call it I call it baby so it's more kind of abstract like dinosaurs I call them dinosaurs not bronchosaurs or whatever whatever the, the the type of dinosaur it is, um, and I think like I think as I think if the the you know having a baby like most people will tell you it definitely sh it make, it makes a big shift in terms of like perception especially perceptions of time. Um, and your own kind of mortality in a way. Uh, and I think with the different themes that I was developing in my work um, with the idea of like the anxiety that we have about the future, um, uh, especially with, I will not, in my work I don't talk about the, the anxiety of political climate because I think it's a, almost like a always <laughs> undergoing kind of, but the, the, the Typically, like you know, in the modern area, like Soviet, like the the belief in the future, especially the belief in technology, is very high. Like you know, like the futurists in Italy, they really believe actually that all this kind of technology will bring great things to humanity. Of course, <laughs> after the Second World War, people, well, I guess, this technology was used not in the best way possible. But still, in the 60s and 70s, this moment of like big hope of like you know what, actually, like we're gonna actually solve all the problems. It's going to be great, and and we live in a in a in a moment now that um, the perception and the the vision of the future is very very bleak. It's not the first time we have that as as as, as a species, I guess. But we and I think we started to basically think, and the idea of extinction uh, is more and more present. And you know, like people will be like, oh my, God, maybe my grand. Children will not even have a planet anymore. And it those kind of it's 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 a fairly recent thing to think about. To and and especially in the idea that um, basically our species can be extinct like without our kind of like control of it. So, you know, it's it's very different than the, the even the nuclear kind of extinction, which was like a more like oh one person is gonna like we feel now we're not in control. Like the nuclear kind of apocalypse in the 60s was more like in a way in control you're like well you know someone's going to do something but here now we feel more like well things are completely out of control and we there's not not much we, i mean we can do like we feel like it's kind of like and i think that particular idea of extinction uh is obviously like the the, the most kind of iconic uh creature that symbolizes extinction is is the dinosaur uh because it's with the dinosaur basically that um that's the idea of previous species extinction is emerging and you know in the in the 19th century there's very like break really breakthrough discoveries about you know like oh actually yeah it was very clear that some animals that were you know were here are not here anymore and there's like you know and it takes a long time to discover why and like discover that there's there was many different extinctions in the past like we say like you know, basically like uh, five main ones, and you know, and now like people are saying that the, the six extinctions over extinctions is on, on, undergoing, and it, it is basically like more or less seventy to eighty percent of species could vanish from the planet, which obviously have a ripple effect that is, you know, pretty like I see you face me like oh my goodness what's going on I was like no, he's no. going to talk about cute things about dinosaurs. <laughs> no, this I mean this is after you know there was an article I think in the Times a couple of days ago about you know how many years before mammals are extinguished from the planet. So it's sort of you know absolutely I mean it, it's not a fun topic to, to think about. Um, but the, one of the things that struck me about the dinosaurs as well is you know you've had this I mean apocalyptic we can call it like sort of um, end of the world. Uh, mood in some of your shows, you know, Montreal and, and now also in the, the Swamp Show downtown, you know, you have fires, you have floods, you have a number of, of natural disasters on a very large scale uh, in pastel murals. Um, but what struck me about the dinosaurs, which, you know, in themselves are probably the largest creatures that ever walked this planet, they're very, very small, your paintings, on copper, very jewel-like, very um, intimate in a way. 
And was that something that was planned, or did it just, you know, the idea of doing a dinosaur so so small and so, you know, and you are in these big spaces downtown as well, where you know you 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 enter the gallery for those of you who've been there, and you're confronted with this massive fire, and then you know as you get into the other room, you have these sort of swampy landscapes and mountains and very sublime, let's say, landscapes, um, and then in the corners you have these little dinosaurs that, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, um, actually, like the. No, because I, 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 I started to paint on copper, and I think very quickly, like it felt it was like the right kind of uh, technique, very small to do those dinosaurs. But actually, I did sketches on pa pastel of those, so they're slightly bigger. But also, actually, one of my plan was to do like a big uh, swamp mural. At some point, was a, a mural with dinosaurs. And actually, Mark, that is not here tonight, probably, but uh, he came to the studio, <laughs> and uh, and I was showing him this. It was basically a swamp with like silhouette of dinosaurs. It's, it was kind of cool, and uh, and he and I, he said and it, I was like, oh, "Do you think this is good, or do you only this one?" He was like, "Oh, definitely only this one. Too too crazy. Those two, those big dinosaurs." And so that, I had like a plan to make them big, but actually that was probably very a good intuition because it's much better to have only the two tiny dinosaurs, and I think it works very well. So I'm very happy that uh, he's not you know like a creator creator, but you know sometimes big a gallery director have great kind of artistic ideas too. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and so it ended up that I, I did those like two little, and so I did like actually two other dinosaurs at the Modern Institutes uh, in Glasgow. So that was the first time, and they're exactly the same size. Uh, and I did four for that show, but only kind of um, showed two. And uh, and I've, I've, I have a kind of definitely a um, different relationship with those dinosaurs um, than other work because I'm keeping all the dinosaurs. I'm not selling those dinosaurs, <laughs> uh, and I'm planning to do that for for anyway for for a little while for now because I'm, I'm you know happy to to collect to make my little collection of uh, of dinosaurs and 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 I still I think the fact they're on copper, uh, this kind of very kind of sh this this shiny kind of surface and they're very small. I think it it makes the the kind of fragility, like obviously, much more like um, because obviously, it, like uh, dinosaurs are, and that's that's something that I was also like we talked a little bit about it. Like uh, when people ask me about the dinosaurs, it's and, and I keep like, kind of pointing out that um, it's it's a complete absence in in art history. Like uh, you know, basically, there's like the first illustrations of dinosaurs is yeah, again, like you know, late 19th century. Um, and and they basically look like dinosaurs already. I mean, they're just like a little bit different. They're much more heavy. And then there's like a, an entire history of how dinosaurs are depicted to this date when now they have feathers and bright colors. Uh, but somehow, like in the last like more or less 200 years, a little bit less than 200 years since the first illustrations, uh, none, no artists had any interests at all. Like it's almost like, you know, I have like few paintings that I know of dinosaurs and obviously few kind of more pop representation of, of dinosaurs in, in Conobri art, but like if you think about, you know, like 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century, more, even like all the surrealists, nobody cares. It's, I mean, nobody cares. They obviously see the, the illustrations, you know, the, it's, it's, it's there and it's like, you know, there's articles and everything. Uh, and I find it kind of, in, in the opposition, there's like a long and strong history and still to this date of like illustrations of dinosaurs that are very popular and, you know, people love looking at them and somehow the art world is very snobby with dinosaurs. <laughs> they really Imagine don't want to see. Manet, Degas, Picasso, Cezanne, yeah. dinosaurs. I mean, it would really be. Uh, I know. Impressionist dinosaurs. I know. That's that, a great I mean, idea. Yeah, I think it would be amazing. Yeah. I, I really want to see Cezanne dinosaurs. I mean, yeah, Cezanne be, dinosaurs. Yeah. I know. That's funny. Know they, nobody did it. Yeah, it's true. It's very strange. Uh, it's the beginning of a whole new history yeah. of dinosaurs. <laughs> Um, so I think on this note, um, we're, we're running a little bit late, but let's open the floor for questions. If anyone has any questions for Nicholas or for me or about any of the shows <laughs> or dinosaurs, if we can answer those questions. I was just asking about the gaze of the uh, sculptures. They look very un like droid-like, robotic in some way, looking into the future. Was that intentional or is that mannequin-like in response to the collage? I know you did that separate from the collage work, but I'm just wondering about your series of work, about the gaze of the... Yeah, so that's, I think, like, going back to the, the idea of the portrait that is kind of this surface, this filter. So that's, that's exactly why, like, you know, like, again, compared to, like, the Rembrandt idea of the portrait is, like, or you have to paint a portrait, you have to paint inside the person, you have to get the character, like really the, all the emotions in the life of the person. And th that's kind of the exact opposite. It's basically painting purely this kind of 
idealized surface of a face. And, and again, going back to Greek sculptures, like they don't have a lot of like, you know, like life in there kind of, you know, they're very like, like st stiff in a way, like they're obviously perfectly proportions and like technically perfectly made. But you know, like the, the, the Romans start to much more like in their sculptures and painting too, but like painting like wrinkles and start to like having real people basically. And so the, the, those sculptures exactly, they, they, it looks like they look through you, they don't look at you at all. And if you look at them, there they seems like there's nothing in them. They completely like, so they have the, this idea of this, this ghost's kind of presence, so this kind of, mask but not an expressive mask in terms of like you know answer or whatever it is it's more like the again the mask of this kind of 3d world that we live in that is like you know like a very i mean actually like that's a strange connection but somehow we, i mean i was talking about today but that was like i didn't finish it but i was watching the um the new indian in jones and for people that watch it you know the first part is him but with cgi is is you know basically young again uh, and and I found it like I mean fascinating because it's it's so bizarre like it's obviously not maybe because it's very well done for sure but again there's this mo the, and I think his voice maybe is his voice from like I mean maybe they restored a little bit but you can feel his voice is definitely an older I mean he's old he's like 80 and uh, I mean not that but you know he's not able to jump on trains and everything and I found it that character it does, like. It does, <laughs> And you know, more and we're gonna have more and more, and we still have that, but we're gonna have more and more of this like strange presence of like, you know, basically CGI AI rendering of people. That's basically that's how they will look to us. They will like be empty, because this kind of Harrison Ford in the Jones in the first 20 minutes is not him. It's like kind of a weird kind of uh, you know. I don't know exactly how they did it, but probably like. I don't know, mapping something, but it's completely like fake, and it's like, uh, and you can really you feel it. I feel it's so. I think it's kind of again, it's kind of what I'm trying to kind of have, you know, in a, maybe a more direct way than <laughs> Dina Jones. But um, just I think there's, oh, well, let's go to the back and then. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I visited your uh, exhibition down in uh, Chelsea the other day, and I saw the smaller paintings that are sort of like a triptych and it reminds me of sort of altar pieces and things like that. And I was wondering sort of what um, the motivation behind using that particular structure for those pieces. Yeah, so those like, yeah, like they're really basically like an altar triptych pieces that is, the, the object is really directly taken from, basically I had this show that was happening in the Pol di Pizzoli in Milan um, and it was basically this, actually like a little bit like the Frick, the Pol di Pizzoli, it's like a, private collection from the, the late 19th right. century. Uh, anyway, there, there's basically like one of those altar um, called actually like a tabernacle, basically it's a pliable altar and it's basically exactly the same shape. And, uh, and I found the object kind of really kind of fascinating because it's, it replicates the, the idea of the altar in a church and especially with the black and white um, outside and the idea of the theater of those objects that were obviously like a painting but also like again like a, a theatrical display because you know m the entire year around the the those those things will be, will be closed and you will only see the black and white uh, and you know a few times a year and uh, yeah we're talking about the Grunwald or like you know the Von Eyck you know ima imagine like you know, and you have less, you didn't have Instagram and all that stuff then, obviously, like, so, like, imagine, like, once a year, like, going to the church, or, like, maybe twice or whatever, how, how many times it was, and, like, they opened that thing, it was probably, like, really spectacular, <laughs> like, really, like, blockbuster Indiana Jones type thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, like, I, I kind of, I was, like, having kind of a lot of, like, kind of um, uh, having fun with, because I will not do that on the scale of the altar, I think it will be a little bit heavy, but on the small scale with the, the trompe l'oeil kind of marble and the black and white on the outside, I think it's kind of, uh, but it's a very direct kind of reference to the, a, a very religious object, uh, which I'm not really shy about those references, because as if you, if you are a Westerner artist, like the, and you love artistry, like the connection with, you know, religious and Christ, Christian art is like so heavily embedded with our storytelling, the aesthetic, the function of art that, that you can't really avoid it. It's like, it's really embedded in what art is basically, so. And you've sort of expanded that also to a larger scale. I mean, the swamp triptych is somewhere between the kind of religious triptych and also stained glass windows. The, yeah, the large yeah, one, yeah. so it's but so yeah, it's more like a piece, yeah, 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 exactly. But yeah, the shape is taking from, the, from exactly from the, the the little altar piece, yeah. I think we had a question here. Yes, I got to see your mural, Swamp, and I have to tell you, I was very, very impressed. 
talking about scale, now you do that in pastel. Usually pastels, in my experience, are usually smaller sizes. This was a huge page. According to the gallery, you were there. Now you have this huge wall, <laughs> and you have pastel, not oil. Could you comment on doing this beautiful mural at, 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 at the gallery downtown? I mean, it's pastel, it takes a long time. So as you're doing it, as you're creating that beautiful swamp, what goes on in your mind? And you know, I'd like to hear from an artist when they use pastel and do this huge mural, not a 12 by 16 or anything like that. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, so the, and the, 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 um, it's true that pastel is historically and still to this day it's used for much smaller formats uh, and there's very little actually pastel. Uh, I mean, in, even in the 18th century, there's little like big pastel, but it's very, I mean, the one that's the, the Content de la Tour is a big pastel, but it's true for mural, obviously, it was not really kind of used. Uh, and it's kind of the, the history of me doing pastel, I've, I started to do charcoal mural, which I think is more kind of, I mean, it's basically the first mural ever done, I guess, <laughs> charcoal. Um, in the cave, you know, it's more or less that. And, uh, and, and I think actually that it was in an LA show and uh, obviously the charcoal was all in black and white. And actually like um, the creator said like, oh, could you, do it? could you do it in pastel on the wall? And I actually said like, no, of course not. Uh, that will not work, it's just impossible. And uh, somehow, you know, she put it in my brain and I was like, maybe actually like, and I went to the studio and I basically sprayed this surface on the wall and I tried and it was actually very easy to, to do. Uh, and then uh, basically I started to do a little bit bigger scale to like that scale that is very big. And actually like I will say that it's slightly unpractical but actually not really because it's, 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 it's actually very fast to do. And that's because like you don't have drying time and you don't have to layer like you know the dripping part is done and so basically and you know pastel you work with your hand. I mean it's physically a little bit you know taxing but uh, and it's, you know, I, I, I enjoy doing it, but there's a limit. Sometimes I'm a little bit like, because you're full of dust and everywhere, it's, it's very tiring and it hurts your hands. But still, it's like, because I did murals with paints, and I, I have to say that, um, you know, for example, there's no tape or like, you know, like, you know, some of the murals can be so tedious, like in terms of like, you know, masking tape and cutting and like you have like 10 people working on it. Like most of those, I mean, the murals actually at the Frick, I was by myself the entire time. Uh, the fire one, I was only by myself, and like I had like two people helping me for the swamp for the first two days. So, which I, you know, I don't love working with ten people around me. It's like, doing a mural. It's kind of a little, uh, but um, and, and I think what is great about pastel mural is the uh, many things, but the uh, the uh, how it uh, basically reflects the lights in a room, which I think in in very often murals, you know, you do with acrylic or oil. That, that was the greatest advantage of fresco because it's matte. Uh, and so basically you don't have this like, sh you know, like shine sheen on the, on the wall because it's so matte that it's absorbed the light, you know, and it's like whoosh. And I think that is so powerful. And, and, and obviously the, the pigment is basically a lot of pure pigment on the wall. And it's kind of pretty amazing to see on that scale so much pigment. Um, so I think actually, like I will say that Somehow, I, think, I mean, it's a little bit of preparation to do the surface and it's a little messy, but at the end of the day, I think it's kind of, uh, I mean, in the Frick, the black, for example, like the fact that it's matte and it's like this kind of super strong black pigment, it's really super kind of effective. It's really, really like if it was black paint, you will obviously, you will have the sheen. It's impossible to have that. And I think, you know, people are always surprised, but, you know, in a way, murals, be it pastel or fresco, are actually a lot faster to paint than, than oil painting because even, even with a real fresco, you have to do it very quickly and it, as, the, as the wall is effectively drying. So you do it in sections in giornate and those are very fast. Yeah. So you can, you know, even if it's a large surface, you know, the idea that Michelangelo is doing the Sistine Chapel almost by himself, it's probably right. I mean, you can do that very quickly. Um, if anyone is interested, the, the, there is a video on the Frick website showing Nicholas painting the, the, the pastels at the, at, at the Frick, it's kind of sped up and it's not, you know, you, you don't have to sit <laughs> for two weeks of like, you know, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but you get a very good sense of how it, it, it's sort of created, so. But, and it, but it was pretty quick. It was yeah. like, you know, it was not that long. A week, 10 days, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, usually also they don't, any, no spaces will give you more than that anyway. So it's kind of, it's very like uh, often you have like, you know, two, two weeks, three weeks max to, uh, because then, you know, obviously, like the scheduling. So, like, you, no matter what you do, you have to be fast anyway. And again, everyone has to see them because they don't survive the project. 
so that's a big, you know, we haven't talked about that, but that's a big part of the, um, the creation is that then they're ephemeral and once the show closes downtown or at the They break, get extinct. They, they're like dinosaurs, <laughs> they, they're gone. <laughs> but the little dinosaurs stay. They're, they're oh, not yeah, going anywhere. Those are, yeah. Hi, Nicholas, and I'm a big fan of your work, and I love your imagination and the vibrant color. I do have a question because I love pastel very much. Um, when you choose pastel, are you concerned pastel will not treat as a, like a serious um, medium in this um, art world? Because the majority of artists are choosing like acrylic and oil painting, and there's a lot of it in the museums. Do you, like, have you ever concern about this like medium? It is a very strange thing, yeah, this pastel is completely underused in, the, uh, in art history, uh, except for Rosalba century, like it's, there's a huge, really big prolific kind of 60, 70 years in the 18th century, and then there's basically like a, a nosedive into oblivion, and basically there's almost no periods that has like, a, as it, only, only that moment was like a lot of artists, and the market was like, you know, like a big thing for pastel. Um, and, and to these dates, there's really like, there's so little artists that's only use, I mean, we, and we did work with Torian and she, she, she did some, but most of my friends that, it, when I did the pastel show at the flag with, um, with you know, Loy and, and Robin and different artists basically that, um, and they, they, all, they, all, they used pastel as many artists in the, in the past as a, as a sketch. Even like, you know, Lou is using mostly like pastel for, for his sketches. Uh, and very little artists use pastel for a finished work, uh, and it's, uh, I mean, it's difficult to exactly explain. I will say that's basically, I I, my little fear of it, it's, a little, it's not really kind of completely academically and historically accurate, but like the way I say it, it's more like the, uh, that I think that the, um, the, the Rococo periods, you know, ends with the French Revolution, and the pastel is kind of very tied up. The, the artist is going to be like, mm, "Where is going here?" That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that this this medium is very like very, it's very attached to a trend and and uh, the Rococo French style, and and with a big prolification of women artists at that at that point, a big huge population of portraits, um, uh, you know, of aristocrats. Uh, and obviously, when the French re Revolution happens, uh, they really dis despise that that's, that's, that aesthetic so much. You know, you have to like <laughs> you have to think David. You know, like you think about Fragonard and David is basically like, <laughs> and, and and in terms of subject matter too, like oh, be like much more serious. You know, don't and and I think what happened is like I think pastel is attached to two things at that point is like portraiture and like a little bit like superficial but also to women and women artists like the French Revolution culturally and artistically is very not a woman kind of <laughs> it was actually the Rococo is a much more progressive period for like you know like actually and even gender and 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 it's very the, the French Revolution like break that very like strongly and I think like basically from then on it's like still attached to something oh pastel it's like it's just like two paint flowers, a portrait. It's kind of not really a serious thing. And still to this day, it's, and you know, like it's still, like an example is still to this, in art, in the art market, typically like oil painting, that's what is expensive. And that's what people still want to have. It's like, oh, they want oil on canvas. It's kind of, it's, it's fat. And if you, everything on paper, everything different. And with my pastel, like, you know, they're on canvas and basically like, well, so what's a painting? We just have to label it as a painting because if it was a drawing, people would be like, oh, a drawing? <laughs> it's, it's, it's still, we're still kind of there. So if that's kind of a little bit of my kind of ex explanation of why pastel, you know, it's, it's still, and obviously there's le less kind of pastel artists. So I guess there's less inspiration, you know, for, for that. But it's, again, it's the medium that is like, and I have, it kind of sounds like, but it is, it's easier to do than oil, it's true. Uh, oil is like, it's actually, and you can, s you know, not to be mean to all the fellow artists, but like, you know, you can see like the level of technicity in, in oil in the last like 50 years is not like crazy. Like pe painters got a little lazy with their, you know, <laughs> it's basically very, a lot of like wet on wet, like kind of quick. It's like all this kind of old master thing is obviously like kind of done. And which pastel, I think you could, that why it will be great for Conobri artists because you don't need to be like a crazy technician to, to paint. So with oil, I think with, it will be great to have a little bit more diversity of how people use oil, but uh, that's my little two cents of it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the 20th century has seen a sort of breakdown of, of 
you know, hierarchies of, 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 of genre, you know, before you had the whole, you know, history, history, religious painting, portraiture, landscape, still life, and then, you know, at the bottom you had dinosaurs, <laughs> dinosaurs. Uh, which were not there at all. I mean, they were so lowly considered that just no one had them. Um, and the same with media. I mean, frescoes and oil paintings were the top of the, of, the, of the category, and then, you know, you went down into pastels and down to drawings, which poor drawings are always sort of at the bottom. Um, but they were also seen as, as, a, as a working part of the artist rather than works of art in themselves. I mean, generalizing a huge amount here. But, um, and in a way that today there is still part of that, but not so much, both in terms of subject matter, I think, and in terms of medium. And actually, I think a, a revelation for many people in the old masters world through your show at Flag was how many contemporary artists, Lewis, but also like Toyin, or you know, a number of other people are working with pastels. And suddenly it's something that, also on fairly monumental scale, I think, as some of Toyin's works are huge. I mean, and, and, and those are also mixed media. It's not always just pastel, but there's other, you know, there's, there's graphite and a number of other things. Um, so the, 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 the playing around with the media, I think it's, I don't think, you know, on the market it's true, especially for old masters, there's still this division between sort of paintings and the uneasy category of where do you put a pastel? Is it a painting? Is it a drawing? Um, and and the, the sort of scope in terms of price. But I think for contemporary art, that's not really the case anymore. Um, no, but there's still no contemporary artist doing pastel, like very little. Like, yeah. I mean, if you go to any art fair now, if you find two pastels, that will be already like a success, I will, I will say. I'll try next time I go to an outfit to like count every pasta. Yeah, yeah. They will probably very little, probably. Great. I think um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for the Thank you so much. Thank you.